over NBC's coast-to-coast network of independent affiliated stations, the University of Chicago Roundtable. Be sure to listen for a special announcement at the close of today's program describing how you can participate in NBC's University of the Air by joining Roundtable Home Study Courses. We present Edward A. Ackerman of the Department of Geography of the University of Chicago. Mr. Ackerman. President Truman, in his inaugural address, called upon this country to embark upon a bold new program for making the benefits of American scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas of the world. He called it an effort for the achievement of peace, plenty, and freedom. This program may well be one of the most significant opportunities of our lifetime toward building a stable world. Through it, we can improve what we believe, uh, that we can prove what we believe in one world. As a citizen, I am much interested in this subject, but I am also aware of the problems it raises for the United States and United States resources. Have we the resources to do it? Should we? Can we afford it? Will it mean lowering our living standards? How will it affect each citizen? Joining me in this roundtable discussion of national resources, progress and poverty, are Gilbert White, geographer and now president of Haverford College, and William Vogt, author of the recent bestseller, Road to Survival. Vote, what are some of the principal aspects of the Truman proposal in your view? Well, Ackerman, President Truman's bold new program is one I heartily applaud. In fact, I outlined a similar plan in my book. But I feel it must be developed with far greater wisdom than we or any other people have displayed in the past. Otherwise, it may turn into a Frankenstein that will do great damage both to the peoples of the world and their resources through destructive exploitation of these resources and by encouraging populations to outrace the possibility of production. White, what do you think? Well, Ackerman, I share Vogt's concern that this bold new program, unless properly planned, may do more harm than good in some areas of great population pressure, such as Eastern Asia. Yet... I feel we cannot dodge the heavy moral responsibility that rests upon all citizens of the world to help solve the problem. It is especially heavy for people of the United States, with its rich resources, both natural and scientific. We should not forget in the United States that here we are distressingly slow in applying this wealth of scientific knowledge, which is proposed we share with others, to our own country in conserving our resources for the use of the American people. President Truman has made a proposal to the world to use American resources and know-how to develop world standards of living. Can the United States carry out such a program? Where do we stand in this country? Have we exhausted our own resources? And can we really afford this worldwide program? Vote. How much do we pay for our high standard of living in terms of our resources? Well, it seems to me we pay plenty, and that White made a good point that we're not treating our own resources as well as we should. We build our high standard of living in large part through wearing them out, by cutting our forests destructively, by going through our native game and timber, by using up the virgin fertility of much of our soils. And we're now trying to prime the pump with improved technology. This increases the cost of capital management and labor. We're doing a good job, but it's expensive. But do you think, Vogt, that by drawing down our resources, we're putting ourselves in the position where we won't be able to maintain this high standard of living? I think there's a real danger of it. But it need not be so. We certainly know enough to change the trend. And as far as the relationship of this to the rest of the world, it seems to me that we have no choice, that it simply makes good sense, as well as being an ethical thing to do to help other areas. But we've got to change the trend here at home. We're cutting our saw timber 50% faster than we're growing it. Between 1934 and 45, it decreased 14%. I've just traveled 10,000 miles through the United States and saw vast, wasted areas of land. 
you think that that uh, means a hopeless picture so far as uh, maintaining our resources of wood for needs in the United States in future? It's not hopeless, but we're not very bright about it. We've had a forest service for 50 years, and they've done a magnificent technical job, but we've never backed them up enough to uh, stop the drain on the basic resource. I suppose that that's uh, about the same situation for all our resources, isn't it, Ackerman, that we uh, have not been very uh, smart about our use of them and that we're letting them drain away at a rate which is far too rapid. Take water. Uh, Last summer I was out in Southern California in Arizona where we are draining down the groundwater resources faster than they're being built up. And really, uh, the future economic life of those areas is dependent upon finding some way of uh, building up again or supplementing those water supplies. Well, that's certainly true. And our most Next to water, or perhaps before water, our most important resource is the soil. I'd agree with that. We've destroyed, for practical purposes, for cultivation at the present time, 100 million acres of our best land, and to some degree eroded or badly damaged another 200 million acres. And yet, Mr. Bolt, our agricultural production is at its highest in history. Doesn't that uh, rather contradict the uh, the phrase that we're or your contention that we're destroying the land? No, it, it doesn't. It's it's the thing I was talking about. We're priming the pump and taking out of the land we have left more effectively than we did in the past. But as Senator Anderson, uh, then Sen- uh, Secretary of Agriculture Anderson, said some years ago, we're doing it by murderous practices in certain areas. Seems to me, Ackerman, that a very good example of what Vogt's talking about is uh, found in our Great Plains. You'll remember that in the 1930s, we looked upon that as a dust bowl, an area that was being destroyed, and yet during the war, with very favorable climatic conditions, we had a tremendous production of wheat and are still having it. And yet we can't count on that area going on producing at this high rate in future periods of dry weather, can we? So that uh, at some time in the future, we probably can expect another drought on the plains. And when that comes, certainly our total agricultural production is going to decline. In 1947, the only bad weather year we had in the 1940s, the corn crop in the corn belt plummeted one billion bushels. What about the mineral situation? That's even more serious. Well, I think, again, in the case of the minerals, the United States certainly is not what it once was. We still produce great quantities of minerals. In fact, in some cases, more than ever before. But the list of minerals which which are abundant is surprisingly short. An official of the Geological Survey recently... Uh, describe the mineral situation in somewhat the following terms. We have abundant supplies of coal, of phosphate, of iron, of molybdenum. We have a supply of approximately 20 years in sight for copper, zinc, aluminum, gold, and petroleum, with the possibility of uh, discoveries which will add to our reserves in the case of petroleum and somewhat lesser possibilities for the metals. We have a supply of 10 years or less of lead, manganese, and vanadium. And we have negligible supplies of platinum, antimony, mercury, tungsten, chromium, nickel, tin, mica, graphite, asbestos, diamonds, and quartz crystals, which are important, of course, in radio and radar. You can see that that is quite a long list of deficiencies. And... As time goes on, our demands for a variety of minerals are increasing. But as we talk about our resources and our population, don't need, we need to remember there's a third factor that's operating here, and that's technology. Now take the case of soils. It's been estimated by a Cornell agronomist that in the United States, if we could bring or help bring the farmers across the country to adopt the farm practices of the best 10% of the farmers in their counties, we would be able to increase our present food production about 50 to 75%. That is, we 
by making technological or applying technological improvements can greatly increase the utility of a given resource. Well, of course, that's what the Department of Agriculture has been trying to do for years through the Extension Service and especially through the Soil Conservation Service. But you remember the old story of the far- farmer who said, don't tell me how to farm any better. I don't farm as good now as I know how to. And that's characteristic not only of the farmer, it's characteristic of most of us in our work. And the human factor is, is the big uh, if in the whole situation, it seems to me. It certainly is. I think it's a factor in our own government. Take the field of water development. Probably one of the big problems there is competition among federal agencies for the responsibility to carry out work. And sometimes that seems to get ahead of of considerations of what's best for the area involved, as in the Missouri Basin. In fact, we have reached a stage there where we might almost say that our plans are for overdevelopment rather than for development. I'm delighted to know that one may mention books on the Chicago Roundtable, and in this connection, I'd like to recommend a book called The Missouri Valley by Rufus Terrell, uh, which is uh, an extremely interesting and illuminating discussion of this whole area, and I think every American, certainly every taxpayer, should read it to orient himself in the months ahead. I'd I'd like, uh, however, to question... uh, a thesis of Terrell's book, and that is that one needs to develop a valley authority in order to make the best use of the resources of that area. Probably we shouldn't take much time on that now, Ackerman, but I know you've been working on that problem yourself. But you you wouldn't, uh, you didn't mean to imply that a valley authority uh, hadn't proved itself to be a good thing, as in the case of the Tennessee Valley. I think it may have proved itself in the Tennessee Valley. I think that doesn't necessarily follow that because that's been the best measure there, it will be the best measure or device in the Missouri Basin or the Columbia Basin, and certainly not necessarily in other parts of the world. But uh, in, in my opinion, the Tennessee Valley is really representative of an idea that is integrated administration of regional resources. And what, whatever the name that we call it by, I think uh, it has proven to be a saving and Uh, to improve production in the area that it has been concerned with. As such, fine, yes. uh, Volch, you mentioned, I think, uh, earlier in our discussion here, that what we do here in the United States with our resources is intimately tied up with the rest of the world. In the same degree, I take it, What the rest of the world does vitally concerns us. What are the world prospects? Is there enough to feed, clothe, and raise world living standards? What does the rest of the world look like? And why are people in many parts of the world today starving? Is the situation actually getting worse, as journalists lead us to believe at times? And what can the United States do about this? This is a long series of questions, but I know that your opinions are very definite. Well, it seems to me that what we do here in the United States is absolutely vital to the rest of the world. In the first place, we are one of the few areas that can fill in the food gaps. A stable economy here is going to have such an impact on the rest of the world that uh, even if it were not necessary to ourselves, it would be necessary to keep us from getting into very serious difficulties. And that, of course, is tied up with wise use of of resources. We're one of the great reservoirs of research and education. Uh, We have one of the best facilities for training people in better use of resources and the land. And finally, a point that we very often forget, I forget myself, and that is that we do a great deal of our farming in the cities here. We manufacture fertilizers, we manufacture machinery, we develop techniques, and so on. Are you suggesting that uh, you feel the world uh, could not feed itself without the help of the United States? I think the world cannot feed itself even with the help of the United States at a decent living standard. Sir John Boyd Orr, if I remember correctly. Uh, Mr. Volt, if I may interrupt, what do you consider a decent living standard? Well, uh, something somewhat better than the carbohydrate uh, diet 
that characterizes so much of the East, a fair amount of protein, protective uh, foods, and so on. Uh, Sir John Boyd Orr uh, estimated when he was head of FAO that to achieve such a diet for the people of the world, we need to increase our food production 110 percent. by 1960. And the way much of the world looks, there isn't much hope of it, because it isn't only a matter of food. The whole environment is involved. And yet, uh, you have the opinions of uh, some eminent uh, men in the Department of Agriculture of the United States that it will be relatively easy to raise the standards, uh, to produce enough food to raise the standards of living. But Ackerman, uh, isn't their estimate based on what could be done within technical limits? That is, by applying well-known uh, agricultural improvements to other parts of the world, better farming devices, and by spreading out into new lands, we might be able to do it. The question is whether we can do it with our present social organization. If you look at the rest of the world, the probabilities of that are not very bright. In the first place, our populations are increasing by 55,000 hungry people a day. In nearly every part of the world outside of Canada and Russia, forests are degenerating. Water tables are falling all over the world. Almost everywhere in the world, grasslands are being degraded by overuse, as they are in 85% of our range. Soil erosion is almost universal through the tropics. And wildlife is, is in a worse condition than the, these other resources. I think, Vote, we could get a little further in considering what we might under this Truman program do in other parts of the world if we tried to discuss particular areas. It's very difficult to generalize about the whole world. For example, if you take the question of population, you could divide the world into three types of regions. There's the region which is relatively underdeveloped and has a relatively small population. And then there's the area like India or China, where there is a tremendous population, and the kind of population that a Duke University economist calls a coiled population. Does he mean by that in the sense of a rattlesnake? It might be a rattlesnake in terms of the future of the world. That is, he, he means that the life expectancy in these areas is low, the birth rate is high, that any improvement in food supply will result in a decrease in the death rate and a tremendous increase in population. It can uncoil in a hurry. Uh, White, I would like to mention Japan in that connection. Uh, Japan is a country with which the United States is very much concerned at the present time, as it has been for the last few years. And we have precisely that problem there, just as we have in China, and or there is in China or India. Well, how are you dealing with that problem in Japan <coughs> today? As I understand it, you've been over with MacArthur in the last month. What is the occupation force trying to do about it? Well, the occupation force is trying to produce as much food as possibly can be raised in Japan. They have not succeeded up to the present time, even though the Japanese farmers and all Japanese have been very cooperative. Uh, food production actually has uh, risen since the end of the war, but there still is a considerable deficit. The United States is having to supply from its own production a, about 20% or a little more, of the Japanese food supply. And they are not living on any American standard of, of living as far as food is concerned. They have very near the bare subsistence, that is, to maintain health. What's the demographer's forecast for the population of Japan 25 years hence? Well, there are varying estimates, and, of course, uh, in forecasting population, there are so many uh, imponderables that you can't arrive at any... Uh, a very accurate one. But we think that by 1970 there will be at least 100 millions in Japan. There are 80 now. And there may be as many as 115. Yet Japan is one of the far eastern areas that has been relatively highly industrialized. We talk about areas like India and China and say that 
unless they too can be industrialized and unless there can be very widespread uh, social changes which would make for smaller families and a smaller birth rate, uh, they will grow out of all proportion to their resources. Can we expect that they'll double as Japan has or treble? Uh, Japan has actually trebled from uh, 1870 until the present time. 1870, uh, Japan had about 26 million people, as nearly as we know. And now, as I mentioned, it has 80. I think that, and it's not fully industrialized even at present. So I think that shows the problem that we have to deal with in this matter of your coiled population. It seems to me, Ackerman, that that problem is a lot worse even than you've suggested. Sir Henry Tizard, at a recent meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, told of a thorough application of DDT to a suburb of Georgetown, British Guiana, that cut the death rate to such an extent that the population is increasing 10% a year. In uh, other words, it will double in 10 years. Now, medical entomologists tell me that that kind of thing can be very cheaply done all over the world. And where does that leave us with our limited areas of land? Well, I would like to mention in this connection that that even though the population of Japan increased or trebled, that the standard of living did rise from 1870 until just before the war. So there is a possibility that technology may outrun the increase in population. And some scientists, I understand, maintain that that may be true for other areas. Doesn't that suggest that our problem of helping... Uh, underdeveloped areas across the world is in part a problem of technology and use of resources, and it's in part a problem of helping bring about a reduction in the birth rate and a change in the social system of the country which makes it possible and desirable to have smaller families and a more nearly stabilized population. Well, uh, White, I think that is certainly true, and of course that brings up the problem of industrialization. I'm not optimistic that there can be a widespread uh, expansion of industry such as took place in the last 50 or 75 years. But there is certainly a tremendous need for industrialization, as I see it, uh, the development of small industries in uh, practically all of these areas where they can use their own resources and their own labor force, take people off the land. What about the Latin American countries with which you've been dealing particularly, Vote? I think there's a great opportunity there for small industries, but as long as they're broken up into small countries, you have these national boundaries and high tariffs, there doesn't seem to be very much hope of developing a widespread industry. I feel that... We have in these areas of coiled population probably our greatest challenge. Can we make it possible from a humanitarian standpoint to prevent great disaster from famine and disease in those countries and thereby let this population begin to uncoil and at the same time take such measures that we can preserve the already meager resources and that we can maintain a population that doesn't grow so fast that, in effect, it blows up in the face of the world. Well, White, I think we're getting into the realm of the unknown there, decidedly. But uh, certainly it's well worth an experiment. Uh, In their present, present state, they certainly are sources of grave social unrest. My feeling, Ackerman, is that uh, we're almost certainly licked in those areas but that we do have enough time so that we can do something in areas such as Latin America. Now, it looks at the present moment as though the population of Latin America is going to double in the next uh, 40 years, let us say. And that, of course, is going to make vastly greater demands on resources, food, uh, timber, and so on. Wouldn't we be wise to do a great deal of work there where we've got some time? But would you just bottle up the populations in Eastern Asia? I think they'll take care of themselves by their own Malthusian mechanisms. It's not a happy prospect. But socially, I should say it's a very unhappy prospect, and I wonder if it's one that we can afford to ignore. I doubt whether the United States could and would stand by and see tremendous reductions in population through 
famine and disease if we felt we had the technical means of preventing it immediately. President Truman, as we have pointed out, has made a proposal for American action. We see that there are two types of areas where it might be carried out. How do the American people decide what to do and what should be our aim and what is involved if we decide upon action? Uh, White, will such programs exhaust or help the United States? I feel that they need not exhaust the United States, but that whether we engage in such programs or not, unless we take much more vigorous steps for conservation of soils and forests and waters in the United States, we're going to have a declining resource base. It seems to me we can't afford not to do it in the interest of world peace. We have a great opportunity to send technicians and know-how, books and and scientific journals abroad. The State Department has been doing this on a modest scale for some time. What about Latin America? There was a very active program uh, developed there under the Office of Foreign Agricultural Relations, carried on and developed by the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs and, and since continued by the State Department. I think I'd sum up the problem in this way. From a technical standpoint, we have enough natural resources in the world to supply the minimum needs of the present and prospective population if if the resources are utilized properly. Now, whether or not we realize that possibility, it seems to me, is primarily a race between population growth on the one hand and human inventiveness and social ingenuity on the other. Do we have enough ingenuity to spread what we know and to adjust it in proper balance to each region. Well, White, I think we definitely have. We haven't uh, even begun to develop the techniques of the social sciences, the means of changing attitudes in this context. We've done a great deal through advertising. Uh, We've heard of the changes in attitudes of the Chinese and so on. There are fundamental uh, changes in points of view. Uh, Vote, in my opinion, we cannot hope to solve the world's population resource problem, at least within our lifetime. But that should not give us a philosophy of despair or of isolationism, as some people seem to have. I believe that as the richest member of the world community, we are morally obligated to do what we can toward helping the less fortunate, and especially those who try sincerely to help themselves. Furthermore, the world is buying time to find a solution to the problem of international peace. Assistance in resource development in foreign countries can be a lasting contribution in this direction. Even though the grave difficulties of the probable program are apparent, any far-sighted person must consider the risks worth taking, for the reward can be great. Thank you, gentlemen. You have been listening to the University of Chicago Roundtable discuss... National Resources, Progress, and Poverty, with Gilbert White, President of Haverford College, William Vogt, author of The Road to Survival, and Edward A. Ackerman of the Department of Geography of the University of Chicago as participants. This week's roundtable pamphlet includes the full text of today's discussion, reading lists, special charts and illustrations, and questions for analysis and discussion. You will want to receive this pamphlet and to study the supplementary materials on problems of resources and conservation. Be sure to write for your copy and send 10 cents in coin with your order to the University of Chicago Roundtable, Chicago 37, Illinois. For $3, you may subscribe to the pamphlet for a full year and receive 52 weekly issues. I'll repeat the address, the University of Chicago Roundtable, Chicago 37, Illinois. And now a special announcement. Did you know the world's population has increased fourfold since the middle of the 17th century and doubled since 1800? Did you know that this rapid and accelerated rate in population has happened only in the last three centuries of world history? Did you know that more than half the world's population has not yet begun its period of phenomenal growth? What does this mean to the United States' position in the world? How does it affect the American economy?
You can learn more about this through a University of Chicago Roundtable Home Study course in Economics in the Modern World, which is a presentation of NBC's University of the Air. This course gives you a library of economic materials so that you may complete the course in your own home. Write your local station or the University of Chicago Roundtable, Chicago 37, Illinois, and ask for the leaflet describing the course Economics in the Modern World. This course is open to all, and you may begin at any time.